Hey Cornerstone, Pastor Sam here and welcome to Midweek and Happy Veterans Day. We are making our way through a series called Heroes of Faith, looking at many of the people who retrospectively are, are heroes to us. They're people who exemplified tremendous faith in facing the hardships of their time. And our hope is that through their example, we can glean things that will help us walk through this season with its unique challenges. They may not be the same as what these heroes faced, uh, but we can apply some, some basic principles that will help us to be faithful, to hope like they did, and to lean into God's promises. And tonight we're going to be looking sort of at the third piece of a mini-series within the series that explores the lives of Eleazar and Rebecca. And Pastor Terry will set up the context, um, but Eleazar was a servant who became like a son to Abraham and, and lived in his household, ultimately stepped into the promise given to Abraham for being the father of future generations. And, and Eleazar got to help fulfill a part of that in, in finding a wife for his son Isaac. And Rebecca is the woman who would become that wife. And so with that, I'm happy to hand this off to Pastor Terry as he shares, and then I'll circle back at the end with a few thoughts. Enjoy. So you know, uh, the series, the Heroes of Faith series, we've been sitting with it over the summer. It's something that is connected to this idea of looking back. It's a New Testament uh, concept of looking backwards in the Older Testament of examples of people who, although they came from a variety of, you know, different cultures. I mean, one of the things we need to remember to do when you're reading the Older Testament is try not to read it for, through the cultural sensibilities of either the present or even the New Testament. It really is something that is embedded in Eastern culture and also goes back in time. This, for example, what we're going to look at today is, it was a far more patriarchal time. It was very much more male-dominated, and everything about the family had to do with what we're going to be looking at. The, again, it's a very Eastern example of, of sort of the, the, you know, the interaction that people have within their culture. Having said that, the Bible is clear that we can look back on these things that God did in the Old Testament and draw from them very real principles and truth that we can very much apply and not only just encouraged, are actually instructed to apply into our lives. So we've been talking about this journey of faith. Now we zeroed in. I've kind of had this little mini series within the larger series, the larger series of Heroes of Faith, the mini series being this three week focus on two rather obscure characters in the scripture, uh, Eliezer, who's mentioned as Abraham's trusted right hand man, his most trusted servant, the manager of his house, uh, his chief steward. And then an, another lesser known figure, a woman named Rebecca, who, when we see her again in the scriptures, emerges as this woman of amazing courage and character, who is a model for how to confront things that might be fearful and intimidating. And she also shows us how to make a journey of faith. And so we're gonna look at these two figures. Now, when we get to the passage that we're gonna look at here, which is in Genesis 24, and you can follow along and you in your Bible, you know, your Bible app, or right here in the handout, we've got the scripture listed. I want to pick up and uh, kind of connect back to where we've been. I'm not going to try to rehearse everything necessarily, but I do want to put it into context because I don't want to assume that everybody is familiar uh, with what we're talking about, nor that we were here. Uh, so it says here in Genesis 24, 52, it says, When Abraham's servant heard their answer, he bowed to the ground and he worshiped the Lord. The servant that's being referred to here as, you know, hearing their answer was the man that I just referred to, Eliezer, who had been the chief steward the chief manager of Abraham's house. And he was rejoicing over the fact and, and started to worship God over the fact that the, the family that he was asking to have permission to be able to have Rebecca come and, and be the wife of Isaac, um, that family was giving their permission and blessing. 
And he had just finished, if you were to look back at what happens earlier in the chapter, he just finishes rehearsing a series of events. The first he tells him about, he tells Rebecca's family about the mission that he had been sent on by Abraham, who was by this time a very old man. Uh, Abraham's wife, had, Sarah, had already died. They had only one son. And yet God had made this incredible promise that from that son, the son of Abraham and Sarah, who was named Isaac. Isaac meant laughter. And uh, it's a great name. But God had told Abraham and Sarah that this miracle son, and he was one, would be the one who would ultimately be a father of nations. But they, they were now old. Isaac wasn't married. Abraham didn't want Isaac to marry someone in that local community that he was in. They didn't have the same faith, belief in God. And he had told his servant to go back to Mesopotamia. He was in Israel, Abraham and Isaac were. Uh, but Mesopotamia, is, we would recognize it by a different word, is, is primarily the region of modern day Iraq, which is in the news all the time now. To go where Abraham's family was and find a woman who would consider marrying Isaac, who was more in alignment with, with the faith in the one true God that they worshiped. And so Eliezer accepts that assignment. He tells the family, you know, God, I, Abraham told me that if I go on this mission, I would, I would be led to the right person. And, and, I, and he goes, and I got to the well, and I, I had this, you know, I made this simple prayer. I prayed that, God, you would show me a woman who would, who, a young woman, if she would come and, and offer me water, but then even more would offer to, to, to water all the camels that we had that I would go, that's the one. It was a simple prayer, a prayer of success, and it's led me to this moment. Rebecca seemed very open, which is also amazing, but I needed to talk with you. And so, you know, they extended this hospitality, they had this conversation, and by the time Eliezer's done, uh, Rebecca's brother, Laban, and his mother say, well, it looks like God is in this. So who are we to oppose it? Yes, Rebecca can go. That's where we pick up right now. Let's watch this and walk this through and we'll kind of move along the way. It says, then he brought, you know, this, he just, you know, Eliezer hears their answer. He bows down into the ground. He worships the Lord. Verse 53, then he brought out silver and gold jewelry and clothing and he presented them to Rebecca. And he also gave expensive presents to her brother and mother. And then they ate their meal and the servant and the men with him stayed there overnight. And so, Everything looked great. It seemed like this is perfect. And he's, he says, but, but early the next morning, Abraham's servant says, would you, would you guys be okay with us going now? And to his surprise, because he feels like, you know, this is why I was sent. Rebecca's willing. You gave the blessing. So I'd rather get going now. And look what they say to him. Well, you know, um, we were thinking about this, and we were hoping that Rebecca could stay with us at least 10 more days, her brother and mother said. And then she can go. But Eliezer says, do not, please do not delay me. Don't do this. It's almost like they were trying to change the, the deal by a little more time. They wanted to double check things. And he says, look, the, he says, please don't delay me. The Lord has made my mission so successful. The very thing that he sent me for has happened. You've even acknowledged it last night. He says, now would you please send me back? Just give me the blessing and let me go with Rebecca so that I can return to, to my master, to Abraham. And well, they said, you know what, why don't we just call in Rebecca? We'll ask her what she thinks. She can make the final call here as well anyway. She needs to sign off if she wants to go now or later. That's going to be her decision. Are you willing? And they asked her, they asked her, are you willing to go with this man now? And she said, um, yes, I am. I will go. And so they said goodbye to Rebecca. They sent her away with Abraham's servant and his men. So here she is agreeing to marry a man she's never met, making a journey of faith, believing a promise that God is involved in this. And she starts off and it says they said goodbye to her. They sent her away with her servant and with, with her childhood nurse who went along with her. And then they gave her a blessing as she parted. Our sister, may you become the mother of many millions. May your descendants be strong and conquer the cities of their enemies. It's a, it's a kind of form blessing. It, it would not have been something just specific necessarily. It would have been a, a, a blessing, just a send off. But it had so much more meaning because what they didn't, realize, or maybe they did in some way, and was that she was indeed this woman who <laughs> was going to become the mother of millions. Not just the physical nation of Israel would flow from her and Isaac, but really, according to the scriptures, the New Testament, that all those who share the same faith of Abraham and have embraced Abraham's descendant, the Messiah Jesus, all those who share that 
in a way, become descendants of Abraham at a spiritual level. So we walk in the same family of faith. And so in a way, she becomes the mother of millions, not just the millions of people naturally, but millions of people spiritually as well. An extraordinary promise fulfilled. Now, in the scripture, the scene shifts from they start their journey. They're heading towards Israel from, you know, the east. They're heading west, southwest. And then the, the Bible switches the scene over to Isaac, who's in Israel. Watch what happens. This is in the other column there. Verse 62. It says, Meanwhile, Isaac, whose home was in the Negev. Now, the Negev is a desert region. If you looked at Israel today, you would see, if one, you would be, if, for those of you who ever take a peek at a map, and when look at Israel, I know that some of us have, have done that, so I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that we wouldn't, but some of us may not have actually looked at a, at, a, at a map and really seen how small Israel is as a nation. I mean, how small that landmass is. It's actually very tiny when you compare it to all the other land around that region. In the land of Israel, even today, the half of that land is the Negev. The Negev is the desert or semi-desert region of Israel. It's the major, it's, it's, the south, it's in the south, not a lot of people are there, but it has its own kind of feel and look. And so they're going to put a little, a little, give you a little idea of what the Negev looks like. You can see it has its own kind of remarkable beauty attached to it. But that's where, that was the region where they were, in, the, in this sort of desert, mountainous area of, of Israel. And so we, we read here that Isaac was there. He, as you know, one evening, look at verse 63, it says, as he was walking and meditating in the fields. It's very picturesque, this description. So here he is in, in the desert fields. He's thinking, he's walking, he's praying. And he's perhaps the one they called laughter is laughing to himself about the possibility of his life changing so dramatically if the one who has been sent is indeed successful with the mission he was sent for. Who will be this woman? who will change his life forever. And as perhaps he's praying about these things and about the next season of his life and how God is turning things in his life and all that may be implied in it, on the horizon he can see at the twilight time a caravan edging over the, over the edge of the horizon and, and in it is that woman who he will ultimately marry. And it says here we're told that as as he looked up, he saw the camels coming. And then when Rebecca looked up, so it switches to her looking back at Isaac. So Isaac's looking, they're looking. It's a great picture. Rebecca looked up and she saw Isaac and she dismounted from her camel. And she said to the servant who was with them, who's that man that's walking in the fields towards us? And he replied, that's him. That's, I, that's my man. That's the one. That's, that's Abraham's son. It's the one I... He says, and Rebecca covered her face with her veil. And then the servant told Isaac, everything that happened, you won't believe everything has happened. I mean, God set this whole thing up. I went as your father said I should. I, I had this meeting, this chance meeting. I don't think it was a chance. I think it was God set it up. And then the family agreed. And Rebecca, this, she agreed to come. And, she's, and look what, how the Bible, look at the brevity, look at the beauty, look at the poetic way in which the Old Testament often so concisely describes something. And it says that uh, Isaac brought Rebecca into her his mother Sarah's tent. Sarah was dead now. And she became his wife, and he loved her deeply. And she was a special comfort to him after the death of his mother. And this is really, really special as well for a different reason, because we know that in an era where polygamy was commonplace, Rebecca will become the one wife of his entire life. That they will be in that sense, atypical of, of, their, of the culture and of their love. And it was something that is done because God had set, really, he set that thing up in an amazing way. Now, for, for us, that's the, that's the account. I think there's some amazing principles for you and me. I really do. And the way I've sort of tried to organize this is by saying, look, what if we could take from each of the three people who are mentioned in this passage, Isaac, Eliezer, and Rebecca, a principle, and then think about our own lives to the prism of that principle, and what we might be thinking about in terms of our journey of faith and our walk with God. And so starting with Isaac, I just want to lay something out and get us thinking about this in, this, in the right direction. I want to suggest that, there, that in some cases, right, and we, we'll see this right here, that there, there are going to be these moments where reflective meditation can be power, a powerful tool, really, for pondering um, you know, and discerning God's will, for getting clarity, for appropriating his peace. What I'm talking about is, it, is meditating and reflecting can allow us to act decisively. Now, 
the picture we're given is of Isaac. And I don't want to run past that. I, I really think it's important for us to be able to carve out space to listen to God and to listen to our lives, especially at critical junctions, transition places, or places where we sense a change is coming, or we feel like something may be coming to an end, a close. At the close of the day, we see the picture of Isaac walking and, and meditating and reflecting in the fields of the desert. Now, here's another picture in the Negev that I think captures a little bit what that might look like as well. You can see how there's kind of a, a barrenness to that landscape. But there's, if you've ever been to the desert, there's actually a beauty attached to it as well, especially at the close of the day or the beginning of the day. But the close of the day has this really unique kind of feel to it. And the idea is that, it, that Isaac had taken, made space at the close of his day. He's thinking about God. He's reflecting. He's meditating. He's thinking. He's moving along the way. And it's and sort of the beauty of, of God's creation. And, you know, um, I've, I've, you know these, these kinds of environments, you know, we live in an amazing place. I mean, San Francisco has a beauty. It's no question about it. And we're so... We're so close to natural beauty, we, we can easily take it for granted. I mean, the beaches, the ocean, the vastness. I mean, it's a great place to be able to think long thoughts, right? And, and, to, and to just be there. You know, I grew up in the city here, born and raised here, and I grew up actually on 47th Avenue. And um, I was, you know, all my boyhood, I, during the summer, you know, they, I was in the sunset, right? And uh, that's where the sun rose and it set and it, it didn't come back in the sunset. It just sort of like ended there, right, in the summertime. It's just fog you know, all the time. And so I, I grew up in that environment, but you know, I grew near, near that place and, and I sort of took for granted its beauty. As I've gotten older, I really, what a beautiful city, you know? And then just to be that close to one of the most remarkable places, beautiful places in the whole world, Yosemite and the valley. And it's, you know, Jamir said it's like the cathedral of, you know, of God, you know? He's, you know, sometimes you see something um, and you go, man, this, this place opens me up to worship the creator. Uh, that's, you know, I, I think about places where I've been that are, have these kind of desert qualities because the desert has its own kind of beauty. It's not an ocean beauty. It's not a bay beauty. It's not, it's not a mountain granite with trees beauty, forest beauty. It's a very different kind of beauty. It almost has a starkness to it. It's almost a haunting beauty to it. Uh, I think it's a very interesting place where it says Isaac was walking and meditating in, in there, you know, places like, I don't know if you've ever been to places like Joshua Tree here in California or Death Valley. Um, I, one time, I, I, when, we, when we were younger, we would take our children when they were little um, to the national parks. And one of the parks that most surprised me that I was so just overwhelmed by was a, a national park called the Badlands in South Dakota. And part of it had to do with, it had very similar characteristics of, of the Negev. These pastels that I would see, you know, the, the the blue and the gray and the, the pink and the violet and the, you know, it just, it, the yellows and the beige, they, it just created a certain kind of feel. And I imagine that is what Isaac was walking around and it's a quiet, it's really quiet too. And it's just, I, I, there's, there's nothing quite like that experience, but the principle of creating space for us to hear God. Again, as people who dwell in urban environment, we may not always really appreciate the fact that we live in a very noisy, connected world. I think we do. The irony is everything we do sometimes is trying to get us to stay connected. But there are important times where we need to create space and disconnect. And then we, and I'm, notice what else Isaac, what is he doing? Not only has he created space, he's, got, he's, he's reflecting, he's meditating. Oh, and we talk about meditation. Remember, when we talk about meditation from the scripture, from the Bible, it is not the same as Eastern philosophical meditation, which is designed essentially, and I know I'm simplifying this, the goal of, of Eastern meditation is to disconnect, in a sense, almost to lose oneself. It, but, but when the Bible talks about meditation, it's talking about not detachment, but attachment. It's talking about attaching ourselves towards God and finding ourselves in God. It's a very different approach, very different. And one of the things we know is that we, will do, we would do well, especially if we want to deepen our lives with God or just be a wiser person, is to incorporate the, the, the discipline that Isaac was clearly involved in. He created space. He's walking. And that's another thing. Walking and praying and thinking and reflecting and meditating, especially at key junctures in our lives, is a very healthy way to approach God. 
you're pondering things, you're not having a lot of noise, you're creating space, and then there's the beauty of nature as well. Hopefully, it's, it's meeting it's physical, it's, it has our senses, we're opening our hearts to God. Think about this, when God starts creation and the story begins, where does it start? In a garden. When, when Calvary is about to be embraced in the moment right on the precipice of the cross, where is that decision made? In a garden. Jesus makes it right there when he says, not my will, but yours be done. In the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, a place you can still see pretty much today, looking on the city of Jerusalem, as he knows he's going to walk into the, the jaw of his enemies, right? And just be devoured, literally, for our sake. Anyway, the fact is it's in the garden, right? And I look at that and I go, Lord, there are times where you, you want us to just create the space to think longer thoughts. And it, how wise that is for us to follow the example. Secondly, look kind of look at this as well. Look at the example of Eliezer and what is the principle that we can gain from this? I think there are, there are some situations, especially consequential ones, where we could follow in what Eliezer does, which is basically don't delay from acting on a sense of what God wants us to do. Um, Eliezer knew he needed to move while the momentum was, was with him. They said to him, you know what, we, we think we need more time. And, and he says, look, would you, please, look, you agreed, the time is now, please don't delay. The older version says, he says to them, um, don't, hinder me not. Don't do this. Don't hold me back from the good thing that I know God has, has opened up here. Come on. I mean, the idea of don't delay. He knew that the time to move was then and now. Now, are there things in our lives that are delaying us from moving forward with God? The things that he's trying to get us to move towards. What are those things? Sometimes they have to do with things of our past. They're kind of like holding us back. It's like, you're, it's, do not delay me. It's like holding me back from moving forward with what God has. Do, hinder me not. It's like, it's like getting in the way of what God's trying to do. It might be habits that we've had. It might be experiences that we've had, ways of thinking, wounds that we've acquired that are sort of like just tethered to us and we carry them and they, they hinder my ability to move forward with what God's trying to do. And this is maybe at a key place. And it's just, we drop back into these thought patterns. I was, I was, you know, just thinking about how sometimes it's, it's stuff that we're holding on to that's keeping us from being able to move forward. Sometimes, as is the case here with Eliezer, he can't, he can't move forward because he can't just take Rebecca without their blessing and permission. He's kind of stuck. And it reminded me, I was having a conversation with someone last night and they said, you know, I, I have this impression that I'm supposed to move forward with something I think God's trying to, me, to get me to courageously step into, but I can't do it because there are people whose permission I need and I can't get it. And I said, well, in a situation like that, you do need to exercise a degree of patience. But there are some situations, and I, and I go, and that's okay. Maybe there's a lot to learn just in that. Maybe that's okay. Because in Eliezer, he couldn't take, Rebecca, even if they had to be, he had, he, he had no power. He couldn't, he couldn't kidnap. That was not going to happen. He had to, he had to have the permission. He had to have the blessing. And I think there are also sometimes where people, hear me out, and I, will actually also, people, they may even care about us, but they may hinder our ability to move forward with God. It's almost like we would say to them, you know, and maybe sometimes it's, intentional sometimes it's not I, I would say by far and away would be more times when it's not but someone can have a very good intention and they may care for 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 us and still it, indirectly vicariously there may be part of the reason why we can't move forward and and, and and in Eliezer's case he couldn't move forward without the blessing of the brother Laban and the mother he needed it Rebecca agreed but it didn't matter without their blessing so you see what I'm saying? There are, and then there are things I think of our, of our own, in our own selves. Sometimes it's a matter of our will. Sometimes it's a matter of our weaknesses, our wounds. I think of those three things, our, our will, our weakness, and our wounds, and how they come into play when it comes to having to wrestle with moving forward with something God's trying to move us towards, a new chapter in our lives, a, a new development of our character a new maturity in who we are as a person, a new way of being that lets go of some of our patterns, right? What are those things God's trying, or something he's trying to get us free to move into, right? That, that we are going to have to be open to changing. And I said to someone um, last evening as well, I said, you know, she goes, well, I, that's all I'm gonna say about that, is that she, it, <laughs> um, she was hurting and I said, it's okay to grieve. It really is. 
It, the, in fact, sometimes the most appropriate thing we need to do is grieve. And then I said, please don't see that as being weak. You know, be gentle on yourself here. I know there's some of us, sometimes we need to toughen up sometimes, but sometimes we just need to be gentle on ourselves and be okay with fluctuating with our emotions. And, and, and God is okay. He loves us. He's a gentle healer. He's all right. He'll walk with us. Our weakness is sometimes not the liability we think it is. One of the things I've come to understand is that in our weakest places, sometimes God has us exactly where he wants us, not because he caused it, but because he wants to use that to bring breakthrough in our lives that a dimension would not come otherwise because we're more open. Broken things tend to have opportunities that proud things can never, ever acquire in God, certainly at a spiritual level. Jesus always said, blessed are the broken compared to blessed are those who do not see their need. It's just a fact. And so then the things in life that would break us break our hearts, those things become actually opportunities for God's grace to show up at another level of of a dimension that we end up saying, you know what? The Lord is in this. He's helping me. And I am so grateful for that. That, And that leads perfectly into this third piece, which is this, and this is where we'll leave it. When we think about Isaac, we think about Eliezer, think about Rebecca's example. What is it? Just stay with me on this. Her example for us has to do with how we confront our fear and how we act with bravery on things, on little faith journeys, sometimes significant faith journeys that God's asking us to make in our lives. And to someone else, it may not look like a lot, but to us, it may be a big deal. For others, they might go, that is a big deal, right? But these faith journeys, sometimes it's not the long haul journey of faith. It's the seasonal journey that God's trying to get us to move into and make that's going to produce a new thing. In her case, she models what it is to have courage and to be brave and to not allow fear of what she cannot know or control to dictate her response. I mean, she really models for us what it means to trust God in the fearful place. Oftentimes, when we look at things like this, we, we forget that, that it's easy, sometimes fear can paralyze us, right? I mean, it can, it can hinder our success. It can suffocate our success. It can paralyze our progress because we're afraid. And, we, and when, when I, we notice that we're starting to get suffocated in fear on something, not only I think is it helpful to have that long space to reflect and to pray and to meditate on God's promises and what his word is for our life, to create that room to, 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 to just ask God, Lord, you know, help me not to be bound by this fear in my life right now. Show me if there's a position you want me to take, a, a journey you want me to make. Um, when we, when we see that, it's really important. We sense that fear is rising up in us to you know, affix ourselves to God and, and to recenter our focus on God, to remind ourselves that I can trust you, Lord. I don't need to be afraid of things. Because when we're afraid, it, it creates all kinds of things. Different people respond to fear in different ways. The Bible says, you know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. And I love the last part of that, 2 Timothy 1.7, and of soundness of mind where so much of our stuff takes place, right? I say this all the time, but, you know, so I've seen people when they're afraid, you wouldn't know it because it shows up as anger. I've watched some who, when they're afraid, when we're afraid, we draw back and we, we won't talk. We're, we won't, we, we begin to just close down, right? But we're really, it's because we're afraid. We don't want to be hurt. Again, that goes back to what I was talking about. But God doesn't want us to live in a fearful way. He really doesn't. He calls us to step forward in courageous ways. And as I was looking at this, and I just will make this last reference here, Rebecca really stepped into her fear and made a journey of faith. And so the question is for us, is there a journey of faith that God is asking us to make that's going to require bravery and not allowing fear to overwhelm us or to cause us to overcompensate in any direction? Because sometimes our fear can get us into a panic place. Sometimes we start, we start, reactively just trying to just protect ourselves and instead of just letting ourselves stay in the right place with God and we start to waver off we pull ourselves back in because we're trying to stay in the healthy place with the Lord you know one of the things one a great promise from the book of Isaiah 41 verse 10 says this fear not for I am with you do not be dismayed I'm your God I will strengthen you yes I will help you how good is this I will uphold you with my righteous hand when you need me. The, you know one of the things I, I believe in, in addition to the idea of creating space 
and quieting our life in a, in a creative way and making room for physical meditation and thinking long thoughts in our lives with God and praying. In addition to that piece, in the midst of God's creation, I also think it's helpful sometimes to claim a, a scripture for a season in our lives. And what I mean by that is we take a promise from God, our word. Sometimes that might be a part of something that is not necessarily contextual, but we sense that God is saying, you know, this is my word for you. And I want you to embrace that word, embrace that promise. And sometimes something like a verse like, like Isaiah 41.10 or, you know, 2 Timothy 1.7 that I just talked about, not having a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and a soundness of mind. We just, we're, we're meant to sit with that in our season, right? As we're trying to ponder about our next step, it could be like on our job, it could be in a relational, around a relational issue, or something that God's trying to do inside of us at an emotional level. The thing is we're pondering that, we're adopting, a, sometimes adopt a verse. We want, this is a great one to do that with. I look at Rebecca and I say, wow, she is someone who is really, in her case, she's, she's trying to leave something behind, she is. She's, it's like she's leaving something behind, her, in her case, her family. And then she's reaching for something that is ahead a life that she doesn't really know what it's going to be like, but she knows this, that there's a promise attached to it. And she moves in that direction. She's got this, between then and, between leaving and getting there, she's got a journey to take of faith. And I keep her thinking about what Apostle Paul said when he said, my, my brothers and sisters, I do not count myself to have apprehended, right? But this one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things that are behind me and I'm reaching forward to the things that are ahead. I press towards that mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's this sense that God calls us in these places where he's trying to birth new things in us. I think about this. I, just, Rebecca's journey was connected to the idea of ultimately birthing something. And it did. That's where, I, where Esau and Jacob, Jacob becomes, his name later becomes Israel. That is the, Jacob is the son of, of, of Isaac and Rebecca, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's all there. The new thing God births is connected to a journey of faith. I'm not saying, I don't know the things that God's trying to birth in our lives. I do know this. If we welcome him into certain, certain seasons where the, we're, we're in a transition especially, or we're contemplating, you know, what is, we're trying to figure out what's the best step to make, that's the place where we just want to welcome the Lord in. Welcome him in. Welcome into that journey. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Uh, we'll have our time of giving and closing psalm. I'm going to pray over this word. So, Lord, I thank you because, again, what you do is, is you walk with us in this life. How good is that? We're not alone. And, you know, we sing songs, and maybe sometimes it can almost seem like, oh, it's just, you know, just trying to use God as a crutch, you know. That's, that's actually, that's not, that's not how I see it. I believe, Lord, that there are, there are, though, real invitations that you make to us to be a growing person who learns how to trust you in our weak zones, especially in our broken places. Yeah, and there's no shame in that. That's called humility. And blessed are the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And Lord, I'd, I'd rather be a, a healing whole person who's humble, if, if, if in, and in some cases even sometimes broken, than a proud person who doesn't even see the need. And I, I do thank you for for the gift of sometimes just being aware of how much we need, need you. There's no shame in that. There's actually great grace there. So we welcome you into our questioning places. We welcome you into our critical junctures, those places in our lives where we've got to make tough calls. We've got to be decisive. We've got to exercise a degree of courage and bravery like Rebecca did and to make a journey that in some ways could seem very intimidating because we can't control the outcome. But we trust you nonetheless. And we walk, we're, we're making that journey in faith, knowing that you'll walk with us all the way and that you're going to birth new things. We ask for your blessing in our own lives, birth new things in us and give us courage, all of us. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen, God. You know, I, I love how Pastor Terry invited us to look at the unfolding of God's promises from you know, three different vantage points you know, from Isaac, Eleazar, and Rebecca. And part of me, you know, I find myself kind of wondering which was easiest for me and which was hardest for me. You know, Isaac, you know, had to wait faithfully and kind of just lean into 
the unfolding of God's promise over time, trusting that he would be faithful as he has been faithful in the past and will be in the future as well. And then Eleazar had to sort of step into the discomfort of standing for what he believed to be right and how to move forward in God's promise as he you know, sort of drew the line and said, no, I need to go and, and, and fulfill this for my, my master. And then Rebecca, you know, she had to step out in faith into what she believed God was calling her to do, even though she didn't know fully what lie, what lie ahead for her. And so for each of us, it's, it's worth considering, you know, which of these is easiest for us to do, which is hardest. And may God help us to, to be bold in faith, to be open to those times of waiting, sometimes you know, drawing a line and saying, you know, I believe this is what is right and beneficial. And I'm going to hold this out of responsibility, out of love, out of trust. And other times we do have to step out in faith into something that we believe to be where God is moving. So may God give us the courage to do each in its appropriate time. We're going to close our time tonight with a song called Tongues of Fire. And this song is going to kind of kick around some of the themes that, that we've been sitting with, as of course it kind of alludes to you know, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on God's people, which stirred up courage and a willingness to press into those things that would require faith and require God to move in mighty ways to bring life flowing out the way that Jesus described. So let's listen to the song and I'll come back with a few things that are coming up this week. Enjoy. The nights we spoke with tongues of fire The days we walked out on the wire We were young and we were not afraid The angels whispered in our ears To tell us what the hilltop fears Up looking. 
we spoke with tongues of fire the days we walked out on the wire when we were young and we were not afraid when we were young we were not afraid You know, that, that song is such a great reminder of the courage that it takes to keep our word, to ask God for help, to step out in faith, to stay out of the woods, and to strive to always come back home into his promises, his plan, and his presence. So let's, let's do that. Let's strive to do that. Let's, let's embrace that opportunity. And so just a, there's a few things coming up this week or in the, the near future we want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, we mentioned this on this past weekend during our, our Sunday services, but wanted to just kind of re-highlight it. We have a special Thanksgiving service that we're creating. Um, since we can't gather the way we normally would at the Mission Campus right now, just for safety and kind of what's, what's best and beneficial, uh, we're doing the next best thing, doing an online on-demand service. So basically Thanksgiving morning, as early as 7 a.m., you can queue up that service, watch it together with family. You can do it over Zoom if you want to. Uh, however you want to engage it, just to, as a way of intentionally you know, starting or cultivating or expressing that gratitude that we have towards God from whom all blessings flow. And so definitely encourage you to check that out Thanksgiving Day, um, and whenever it is convenient or whenever it's most helpful to you. And then as has been our pattern for the last month and a half or so, we are going to continue having our weekly communion gatherings over at the Reardon campus in the central courtyard on nice days. And then if we have any inclement weather like this past weekend because of the wind, we moved into that, that front, we call it the breezeway. Um, on, on windy days, maybe we should call it the columnade, or, or, but it's the, that front area that's well protected from both the wind and the rain. And so on, on you know, poor weather days, we'll be out there. But we're just going to keep on building that pattern and coming back together, which you know, now that there's a really uh, hopeful vaccine in the works that looks like that it might have some promise, uh, we can start really you know, pushing towards when it is safe and, and good to be able to gather in, in what would feel more and more like normal. And so if you want to start building that now, you know, when we come together, we wear masks, we get to share a song, we, I, I share just a quick word, and then we have a time of communion as a, a means of remembering you know, the hope that we have in Him, which is you know, so important to have sources of hope right now, just with the way this year has gone. And so let's lean into him and uh, ongoing, we're going to keep having you know, our online services at 9 and 11. Even when we come back together, we're going to keep that pattern going and kind of see that as another campus for those who aren't ready to come back for any reason or, or maybe can't. And so at 9 and 11, we have you know, our services with the, the chat function happening. And then at 1 p.m., it's on demand as well. And we have our, our three sort of mediums where we, we, we have it playing. So Facebook, YouTube, and our website. So please stay connected, please stay grateful, and let's encourage one another as we seek to just stay close to God, uh, especially as we head into the holidays. So God bless you all, have a great week, and we'll see you soon.